So. This, this is exciting because this is a new episode. I don't know this one. I know. How many times will we have to record this one? Let's find out. <laughs> So I wanted to cover a less technical topic. There we go. We just lost 50% of our viewers right there and then. But uh, Goodbye. Thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you to everyone who stayed. Because um, I do think it's an important one for most developers. I want to talk about interviewing, like particularly interviewing for technical roles. That's a controversial topic, isn't it? Oh, well, I'm sure we'll find out in the comments if it's controversial or not. But yeah, I, I think interviewing is really difficult. It, like, as a system, it's unusual. Like, imagine that after a speed dating session, you had to send one of the people you met a marriage proposal there and then, because that's kind of how interviews work, right? You spend... You do know a, they made TV shows out of that concept, right? What, with the job thing or the marriage thing? The marriage thing, speed dating, then marriage. That's interesting, isn't it? Because like, yeah, shows like The Apprentice, they spend a whole series on it, but like some of these dating shows, it is just like an hour. So I guess that is more realistically like an interview. I think interviewing well as an, I mean, interviewing can mean so many things. It is, you know, you want, you're looking for someone to add to your business, to your company. And I guess the purpose is figuring out if that person that you are considering a candidate is actually good for the role. And if you are good for the candidate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you get an hour or two with them to decide that. And then you pick one and propose that you enter into a long-term relationship backed by a contract. There you go, job done. So I thought I would give my tips for interviewing. I don't claim to be perfect at it, um, but I've been doing it for a number of years. So these are just my reckons, really. Um, but at Google, I was given an award for being one of the top interviewers. Which means the most interviews, not the best interviews. Uh, let's, yes, okay, fair enough. It was more the number. <laughs> But they get me to do them because I'm because I'm good at them. That's what I tell myself. Can you remember what the award was, by the way? Do you mean the the yellow helium balloon star? That's right. I got a balloon. So and it it lived on your desk, I think, for a considerable amount of time. I had that balloon for a, nine months, I think. It it was a good balloon. It was a high quality balloon. Uh, and even once that balloon started to drift down and hit my co-workers in the face uh, and they said can you get rid of that i said no that's my balloon i got it for doing interviews i'm keeping it until it hits the floor that sounds like a little you know jokey embellishment but that actually happened like yep. we we were all observing the balloon slight hover slightly lower every day as it slowly fell to his death and uh i people thought i got rid of it because it was gone, but what I'd actually done is put it in the recycling bin, knowing that when someone would open the recycling bin, the balloon would come back out. <laughs> uh, I'm fun to work with. Anyway, if you're watching this at home and you think you know better than me at interviewing, where's your balloon? Show me your balloon and then we'll talk. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> but yeah, a lot of this is subjective and I'm I'm looking forward to the discussion in the comments around this and hearing other points of views, uh, provided the moderators don't delete everything, as they've been doing recently. Sorry about that. Um, but here are my reckons. First up, I want to talk about the, the general attitude. And you hit upon this uh, uh, before. You're trying to find the candidate who's going to be the best employee for your company, uh, the best teammate for you as well, if, if that's what you're hiring for. My first piece of advice is don't try to defeat the candidate and this sounds obvious, but I see this a lot. Uh, like The candidate is competing against other candidates indirectly. They're not competing against you. Uh, you're not there to try and catch them out. Uh, you, you should try and be on the candidate's side uh, like you would with a, with a teammate. And I say should because we know from Twitter and YouTube comments that there are a lot of people who have the personality of the Riddler from Batman. You know, it's all of that kind of, I am more superior than you, therefore I win. And I just say to people like that, grow up, pack that in, and definitely do not take it into a job interview because it's it's a horrible thing to do. Um, it might seem like I'm laboring Can you this implement point. inheritance just with functions and manual prototype manipulation? You don't, you fail. I've definitely got that stuff wrong before as well. Mm. Like what you just said there, I've, I've 
use that question in interviews and I am embarrassed about it. So I, I'm saying stuff, the advice I'm giving here, like I say, I'm not perfect. It's based on the stuff that I've got wrong as well. And it might seem like I'm laboring some of these points, but you watch TV and films and the way interviews are, are dramatized there, a, a lot of people think that's how it's supposed to be. I, let's take a, a tech example. A friend of mine interviewed for an agency in London and as part of the interview, they asked her to take a, a look at their website, their agency sites, and you know, suggest things that could be improved, that kind of thing. And they had this 404 page that was this big, cute image. You, you know cute 404 pages, right? You've, you've seen them before. Sure. But she pointed out that you know, their website has this consistent nav at the top and at the bottom, except their 404 page. And she was like, well, hang on, this, this could be a problem because a 404 is a dead end for the user that they might have had a, a misspelled URL or something and you're you're not giving them that nav, that, that way of that they could help themselves out so that there's an improvement. And this didn't sit well clearly with, with well, the head of design at the company and during the, the Q&A section uh, launched in with, I've got a question for you. Why do you hate delight? <laughs> And I was told this story five years ago and it still makes me angry because it's, it's exactly that, you know. Uh, my friend did learn from that experience that there was someone senior in the company who was toxic. Uh, so it kind of dodged a bullet. So it was useful in some ways, but seriously, like a candidate is nervous in an interview situation and they're in an unfamiliar place. So if you're the kind of person that takes advantage of that to land some punches, you're a bully. Like there's no pride or honor in that. There's, there's no benefit in doing it. It's a suggestion, and I don't think, also don't think those two things were mutually exclusive. You could have still left the four four page queued with the head bar and a bottom bar, um, and you could, I mean, it's your opinion to disagree with a candidate's suggestion, but you have just enough to justify your opinion as they have to justify theirs. So in the end, it should be an actually a constructive dialogue, and I think if anything, as you said, the company failed that interview themselves then. Yeah. Absolutely. My next piece of advice is uh, don't judge the candidate on unrelated things. And again, it's another thing. I mean, your shirt is questionable today. <laughs> yeah, I've gone quite bright today. Uh, I, I actually bought this for doing these recordings because I, every time we've been filming, I keep getting told to wear something brighter. So I, I actually bought this with recording in mind. Which is unusual for you because you usually wrap the conference shirts exclusively. I usually wear shirts I got for free at conferences, but turns out conferences aren't happening right now. So I've had to start buying clothing. So I think of me during the pandemic <laughs> having to buy clothes. But yeah, don't judge people on unrelated things. And, and yeah, clothing is one of them. But I saw this Twitter thread recently where someone in the web development community was saying they judge candidates on the setup of their code editor. Like uh, an example they gave was the, the kind of syntax highlighting they use. And this is, similar to judging people by clothes. And I do have friends in old tech who will judge people by the suit they wear to the interview. And in both cases, like syntax highlighting, the suit thing, folks will defend that attitude by saying, well, it tends to correlate with ability or it tends to correlate with professionalism in, in terms of the suit thing. But these things are just feeding into your biases. And if you interview properly, you can actually test for ability. You can actually test for professionalism. You don't have to crystal ball these things. You don't have to read tea leaves or other things because it's, it's, it's inaccurate and it's unfair. Yeah, I mean, statistics rule 101 is correlation is not the same thing as causation. Just because things correlate doesn't allow you to look at the effect and, you know, imply back that the cause is also true. I, you know, I remember that the, the core team of Go, the programming language, um, you know, pretty famous people with um, Rob Pike and Russ Cox and similar people, and they all are advocates of not using syntax highlighting. Are you telling me that those people are not highly productive good engineers? I am not so sure. And as you say, like, don't, I mean, the, the main problem is don't use proxy metrics. Don't, if you are in an interview, you can, as you just said, actually measure directly whether the capabilities that you need are present in the candidate. There's no need to rely on proxy metrics like this person is not using the same editor as me, therefore. Bad. Uh, absolutely. Um, to give a couple of examples of that, 10 years ago, I was doing some job interviews 
and I took along one of those tiny little notebook laptop things that were a trend at the time. Uh, and I had Sublime Text on it. I didn't use it often for coding, uh, but it was sort of set up. It wasn't set up well, but it was possible. And I brought that along with me for coding interviews. And the reason I was bringing that along with me is it was the only portable device I had. It was the one that I could afford. I had a desktop machine at home, but this was the one portable device I could afford. Could have brought that, I guess. I could have, could have brought the whole desktop <laughs> unit, slammed that down on the desk, and it's like, can I get a, a plug socket, plug socket, anyway. But yeah, so, so but if it, it's kind of horrible to think that someone would see this tiny laptop and think that that's how I normally did things, or that that was the best I could set up an IDE. And the same goes with clothing. Like To most job interviews I've been to, I'm wearing what I was wearing for my job, my, my job at the time. Because if I turned up for work with a suit, there's only so many times that I can say, you know, wedding or funeral. It's like, well, what is it today? Oh, it's a funeral this time. Yeah, it's a funeral for the person that got married yesterday. It was a very eventful wedding, you know? Like, it doesn't work. <laughs> People are just going to wear what they were wearing or, you know, what they're comfortable with. Yeah. But I would say there are uh, exceptions to some of these things. Like, maybe there are cases where the role does involve um, seeing how the candidate handles uh, someone who's being aggressive and argumentative. Maybe the role does involve familiarity uh, with some of the IDE trends, plugins, or maybe the role does involve someone being dressed in a particular way. Again, you should test for these things, but also tell the candidate that that's what you're testing for, like days in advance, like tell them that's what you're going to be assessing. So they should prepare for that. Uh, like, you know, if you're going to have a coding test, let them know you're going to have a coding test. If they need to bring their own laptop, let them know. It's, yeah, it sounds simple, but it goes wrong in practice quite a lot. I agree. And I think there could be more clarity here as well in many instances that I've seen where it's just like, what you're going to test and how you're going to test it. Like often, you know, we often talk about either whiteboard interviews, which have gotten a lot of criticism because that's not how you do your job. Like you don't write code on a whiteboard. And I know how, I remember how painful it is to like write code, write curly braces with a big marker on a big whiteboard. It's just not how your eye has been trained on a daily basis to perceive your own code. And it will just lower your abilities. And even to this day, I often end up in a situation where I have to tell an, an interview candidate that, you know, they expect people to write their code in a Google Doc, which is better than on a whiteboard. But a Google Doc is not what we are used to writing code in. So, you know, Google Docs doesn't take care of indentation or syntax highlighting or any of those sort of things. And so I always try to be very vocal about, like, I understand this is not your IDE. Don't worry about, you know, syntactical errors misspelled API names. We all know that IDEs take care of that for us. It's about talking about the problem, knowing that you have the right solution. Often, you know, we also know that we Google a lot. We get help from the internet, which sometimes in interviews for some reason is frowned upon, which I, I technically I also don't understand. And all these things I think should, as you say, should be laid out before. And what are the criteria? Why are these criteria there? And what is allowed, what is not allowed. And and most of what you just said on when it comes to coding questions uh, has just taken care of a big chunk of my content that's coming up later. In, in this. Apologies, we can no. just skip my comments. No, no, that's no. We'll keep we'll keep those in because I, I can just skip it later on. But and I do want to talk more about uh, testing for coding. But first, I want to just start with the very beginning of the interview, or even just slightly before the, the interview, because I would say make sure the candidate is comfortable, like. Do they need a bathroom break? Uh, do they need a break for any other reason? Do they need a drink? Some of these are more important when it comes to on-site interviews than uh, you know VC in interviews. Uh, but uh, to give an example, we had a, a candidate come into Google who they'd had to rush because a train was delayed. So they'd sort of run to the office and as such, they were sweating. And so I just said, hey, do you want to take 20 minutes to, to cool down? And they said yes. And I don't know if they would have asked for that if I didn't offer it. But it felt important because, well, I know how I get in that situation. Like, I end up in a sweat loop because I'm sweating because I'm hot. Then I start getting embarrassed that I'm sweating. And eventually just shame ends up siphoning all of the water out of my body. And I am not going to interview well when I'm like that. No, and that's the thing. If you're running, you know, 
evolutionarily speaking, you are in fight or flight, which means your blood is anywhere in your muscles but not your brain, which will significantly hurt your chance of using it correctly. And those things interviewers, I think, need to be aware of. Yep, you, you want the candidate at their best, so enable them to be that. All right, let's talk about the questions. I would say, maybe this is controversial, but use the same questions for each candidate. Like some say, I well, they prefer more flowing, natural conversation. But I prefer the same questions because it's a, a stronger basis for comparison. It also avoids some unconscious bias. Like you can branch off your questions with follow-ups and that kind of thing. But I would say stick to the, the same core questions for each candidate. I, I actually do the same thing. I have the same question that I've been using for a long time, which actually is helpful because I know what my level of expectation should be. Like what is the bell curve of people at different levels, how far do they get? What kind of traps do they run into? How can I recognize early what, you know, what holotype of in interview candidate this is and how can I help them get over a hump that is potentially just a red herring to actually evaluating their actual performance and capabilities. Um, so I think that's, that's really, really good advice. And yeah, you can refine it over time. You can find different branches over time for people with different skills. Some people care about memory optimization. Some people care about runtime optimization. Some people care about the visualization. And all of these things, you can usually take your problem down different roads while still sticking to the original question so you know what to expect. Absolutely. Uh, but I would say for the first question, start open-ended and uncontroversial. Don't make it a big technical deep dive, like try and ease the candidate in. I usually go for something like, in terms of work, what do you enjoy doing? Um, or what do you want to focus on in this Apologies, yeah, I was jumping to technical in like coding questions, but you're right, obviously the interview doesn't shouldn't start with that actually, because it is very important to get to know your candidate. So, and just, you know, what kind of person are you talking to? Yeah, and it just, me it gives them an easy question that they can answer as well. And so it, it kind of puts them at ease. I would say, especially if you're saying, what do you want to do in the role or what do you enjoy doing? I have seen a lot of candidates, um, I would say this correlates uh, with younger candidates, but it doesn't matter, but it, it does tend to, uh, will say something like, or they'll take an attitude of like, I'll do whatever it takes, sir. You know, they, they, they're they really eager to please. And if that happens, I try and nip that in the bud and say, no, like, you know, here's the things that I like to focus on. Here's the things I don't like. You know, by example, saying, look, it's it's okay. To, to have a focus, it's okay to have an opinion on this stuff. And with this question, yeah, it's mostly about easing them in, but I'm also looking to see that they've thought about the role uh, and that they have enough experience to know the things they enjoy. I mean, and this is specific to developer relations, but I always think developer relations has so many different facets, right? You can, you can do the stupid stuff that we do by doing videos. You can write articles, you can write libraries, you can go to conferences, you can, communicate more with the engineering team and help them out set the right roadmap. There's so many different facets of developer relations that are part of the role that actually nobody can do all of these at the same time at the, at the same level. You will be better at some and you will enjoy some more than others. And that's exactly what is interesting actually about candidates. Where do they see their strengths and what kind of part do they actually know is part of the role? Which part they maybe didn't know is part of the role? These are all interesting conversations to have. Yes. But no matter what the first question is, there's something else that happens quite a lot. And that's that the candidate has been thinking about this interview for a while. They've been thinking of what they're going to say and the points they want to get across. And sometimes the question you ask first doesn't quite match what they were expecting, but they're not gonna let that stop them. They're gonna give the answer to the question they wish you asked instead. And it's tempting to get sarcastic at this point, but, Again, you're not there to win. Avoid telling them off. Just let them say their bit and then rephrase your question and ask it again. Yeah, and we have you have to be careful that people are going to be nervous. Like they're potentially they're scared to bits that they're now, depending on the company, have one interview, two interviews, five interviews, and they probably want to get the job. Otherwise, they wouldn't be here. And that might just inhibit them from parsing the question correctly. And some people need to prepare for an interview to feel calm and to be able to get through it. And so it, it is, as you say, it is tempting to be like, ha, candidate can't even listen to a question. But be careful about those kind of assumptions. And I, I would say if that's something they do throughout the interview, it's noteworthy that, you know, they're, they're not great at listening, maybe. Uh, uh, and that could be an issue for an employee. But if it's with the first question, 
I wouldn't worry about it. All right, let's do a little bit of let's do a role play for this for this next point. So, uh, I, oh boy, I want you to ask me the question that is on the screen. All right, Jake. Hello. How would you defeat a giant robot army? Uh, well, um, oh, good question, by the way. I would build an even bigger robot suit, and I would punch all the evil robots in their robot dicks until they were very sorry about the whole thing and the planet was saved. Well done. 10 out of 10. You're hired. Okay, let's try that again. <laughs> Another question for you. Jake, so tell me about a time you helped defeat a giant robot army. I've never done that. Fired. <laughs> <laughs> and if you were looking for someone to fight giant robots, you just learned something useful. I don't have the experience. Now, aspirational questions are okay, especially as an opener. But if there's a way to phrase your question that taps into actual experience, I would say that's usually the better way. Like if you ask the candidate, how would you handle a disagreement with a coworker? You're asking for a theoretical answer. You'll get, you'll get a fantasy answer. And that's not as useful as if you said, tell me about a disagreement you had with a coworker and what you did to resolve it. Now you're getting something real. I punched him in the face. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's, that, that's an important <laughs> thing to learn. You want to learn that as, if you've got someone violent on your hands, that's something you want to learn as early as possible, hopefully before hiring them. But yeah, you, if you're asking for evidence, you learn about their experience, you learn about their attitude, you also learn about their communication skills through the, their telling of the story. If the candidate doesn't have an answer, um, offer them thinking time. If they can't think of anything, then say, sure, okay, you, you can give me the, the theoretical version. What would you do? Not very useful to you, but at least the candidate gets through the question. Uh, which brings me to my next point. Try to avoid making a candidate feel like a failure, like even if they kind of are. Like if they if they flunk a question, try and try and make it so it they didn't. Like interviews are stressful and high pressure. You're trying to get the best out of the candidate. If they struggle with a question, help them through it, even if it becomes useless to you uh, in terms of the interview. At least they feel like they got through it uh, and they're not taking negative baggage into the next question or, or the next interview. Because it could have just been that one question that they struggle with like due to nerves they got in a mess or, or, or whatever. Yeah, or you tapped into their weak spot in terms of topic. These are all, like, it could just be that you as the one interviewer got unlucky with this candidate in a specific constellation. And on that note, I would also avoid the typical phrases where you go like, oh, that's an interesting answer. Because even though it is sugar-coated, inter interview candidates can pick up on that. And then you have just increased the pressure without even realizing. So try to be genuine about helping them and actually wanting them to succeed. Also, I'd say that if you're expecting the candidate to say something negative about themselves, or the company, make sure the candidate knows that's okay. Like I, a lot of candidates are nervous about this and it'll work against them. What they tend to do is actually say something positive, but like wrap it as a negative. Like, you know, my problem is I'm too helpful. Or I think the problem with the company is there's no way it can be improved or something like that. So just let them know, hey, you know, say something negative about yourself or, you know, say that you're looking for people who will change things about the company. So you're looking for people with those kinds of ideas. Or it, so it kind of puts them, you're letting them know it, it's safe to say negative things both about themselves or about the company. Okay, it's time that we talked about the coding question, which we've sort of mentioned. Dun, dun, dun. You, you ruined all my content, so much. No, it's this, uh, your, your points were very good because it's some of the stuff that I wanted to say as well. I think it's coding tests are controversial. I think it's good to assess the candidate's ability, uh, whether a coding exercise is the right way. Uh, I don't know for sure. I, I tend to do a 20 to 30 minute coding exercise in an interview. Uh, as such, the questions I use tend to be simplified compared to real world equivalents, which is a weakness of that system. There are alternatives. I've seen companies do homework assignments or longer pair programming sessions. Um, it's a, it's a difficult balance to get right. Like something short is short, which is good. Something longer can be more realistic, but then it might not be respectful of the candidate's time. Like remember, they've got a full-time job. So if you're taking them in for you know, a whole day of job experience, essentially, uh, one, I hope you're paying them for that, but also, you know, they've got a full-time job. Do they actually, you know, you're taking a lot of their time away to do this. On the one hand, you know, the, the coding exercise during an interview is, 
inherently unrealistic of an engineering job because you will spend the entire day on coding most likely and not just 20 minutes on a problem you have just discovered where you are not allowed to Google things. It is inherently unrealistic. Some companies have you know, try to make it more realistic by taking a bigger realistic problem and giving the candidate a week to take it home. But as you said, that is not only disrespectful potentially of their time because they might have a job so they now have to sacrifice their evenings, but also companies are giving them work that they could actually use, like that, that is useful to them. And now they have interview candidates do work for them, which is also not fair. So it is an extremely delicate balance to strike. Yes, and I'm going to stick to my experience here, uh, so it's the small coding exercise. In terms of that stuff, I would say avoid write this particular algorithm. The infamous invert the binary tree. Yeah, so instead of write code to invert this binary tree, present a more real-world example, which could be solved by inverting a binary tree. If the candidate realizes that inverting a binary tree is the right way to solve the problem, that's like 85% of the problem solved. Like In the real world, they could look up how to invert a binary tree if they, if they couldn't remember it. Uh, the important bit is being able to connect the, the theory with the practice. Uh, a lot of candidates, they, they cram, learn all of these algorithms, but if they can't see a problem and realize which algorithm they need to use, you know that's, that's a gap in their learning and it's, it's something that's useful to you as a, an interviewer to find that out early, because those connections are, are, are the most important thing. Yeah, as a, as a little tip from me as an interviewer who pe to people who take interviews, who interview at companies, for me, and I, actually I, can't, I only can speak for myself, obviously, but if you are solving a problem and you know there exists an algorithm or you even know the name but not how it works, for me, it is a 10 out of 10 points answer if you say, let's assume I have the function called invert binary tree and you just call it without, like you just use it in your code without having the implementation. Knowing an algorithm off the top of your head and how to implement it, to me, is not part of the job unless you are working on, I don't know, the, the library that is inverting binary trees and you are interviewing for that job. Then yes, then that is part of the job, but that is the niche in the general case. If you know there are solutions and you can even name them, you get four points from my end. Yeah, I would say when I'm interviewing as well, it doesn't matter if they can't name the algorithm. Like if, if they write what is inverting a binary tree, but they never say the words binary tree or inverting, doesn't matter. I, I don't need someone to name those things. I would say, yeah, try and find something real world as well. Like maybe a problem that you solved as part of the job that they're applying for. But of course, if it's something that took you hours to solve, it's not fair to expect them to solve it in 30 minutes. So you, you would really sort of boil it down to maybe the the, the interesting parts that are solvable in a, in a short amount of time. Uh, also, try and find something with multiple phases. It's something that has like a simple solution that maybe isn't optimal, uh, and then you can build on top of it to make, make it better or make it faster or make it hit edge cases. I strongly agree with this. I, I like problems with multiple solutions with different, not only complexity, but it's a trade-off. And even just having a conversation about these trade-offs can be very interesting to assess how much the candidate has thought about trade-offs, memory trade-off, runtime trade-off, code complexity maintenance trade-off. These are all things that you know matter usually in, in real cases. And it helps you ensure that, as you said earlier, feel make the candidate feel like they're succeeding because it is the more solutions that are possible, the more likely it is they will find one of them and can help you or can um, can explain them to you. And something that actually is really nice once they have found a solution is something that I often use, like ask them to write one or two unit tests, which, you know, oh, that's nice. makes them think about can, can they actually, you know, abstract the interface? Can they figure out edge cases that are worth testing? How do they test? And all these little things can be very, very interesting to talk about. Yes, and if the candidate struggles as well, if you've got a multi-phased question, you can just help them to one of the phases, the next phase, and then call it a day. And, and you know, the candidate feels like they've, they've achieved something. They're not taking negative energy into the, into the next interview. I would say if you're doing that kind of thing, be careful you don't scare the candidate with simplicity. Like let them know it's multiple phases. I've seen candidates freeze up because the start of a question is relatively simple. They feel it's simple. 
and they're looking for the gotcha. They're looking for the complicated bit they haven't spotted, but it's not there. Um, yeah. And I've definitely had that. One of, my, one of my old questions, or one of my old series of interview questions for the coding started with, okay, let's make the tools we need for the bigger question. What, how do you generate a random number between A and B? And as exactly as you said, people froze up and were wondering like, they had a solution, but surely it can't be that simple. And so I, I've learned over time to be like, this is not a trick question. We are building simple tools that we can put together later on for something way bigger. So just roll with me. Yeah, I, I would say uh, definitely avoid using the word simple as well in case the candidate True. does no, struggle with that. That's very good, that's very good advice. Um, I usually say something like, if you think of a solution, but you're unsure whether it's optimal or complete, don't worry about it, write it down. Uh, it's better to write something down and then we build upon that rather than try and get it perfect first time and end up with nothing, which I have seen happen in some interviews as well. During these questions, helping the candidate is fine. Just make a note of how much help they needed because that's part of your assessment. Uh, again, it means they leave the question hopefully feeling positive as well. Here's, here's something that you, you mentioned earlier as well. Allow them to use their own laptop. Don't make them code on a whiteboard. Like if they want to use a whiteboard, that's fine, uh, but don't make them. Don't make them code in a Google Doc. And this is me apologizing for every Google interview where this still happens. I refuse to take part in this, even if the interview advice I'm given is say, telling me to use a Google Doc. I don't, because I just don't think it's right. Um, so yes, that does still happen, and I'm sorry about it. No, people should be using an environment that they are comfortable with. Also, try not to assess too much at once. If you're testing the algorithmic problem solving, tell them you're not worried about variable naming because that probably doesn't matter. You said some of this stuff before. If you do care about variable naming, maybe present them with some badly written code and ask them to refactor it to be more maintainable because then the algorithm's already there. They don't have to worry about that. They just have to read the code uh, and make it better. Also, don't test memory. Uh, you said this as well. Allow them to look stuff up, like method names. Like remembering how slice works versus substring in JavaScript, it doesn't matter. Uh, I usually tell candidates to use me as a search engine and they can ask me the questions and either I'll tell them or I'll look it up myself because it, it's good to sort of hear where, where they're, what they're thinking yeah. and, that, and that's a good way of doing that. I, whenever I, I've done the same thing where I often offer candidates to use their editor instead of the Google Doc. And some candidates still choose the Google Doc, but you know, it's their choice at that point. Um, but in in, in the editor where I just ask them to share the screen with me so I can see what they're doing. Um, I don't think autocomplete is cheating, not at all. Like it is a tool we all use when we work. Why would it be cheating? I, I've seen this a couple of times where people, you know, you are not allowed, like it's more like an exam where they expect you to know everything on the top of your head, which is just wildly unrealistic and not in line with what the job actually looks like. We all make mistakes, more so under interview pressure. And if the candidate has like an off by one error, is it worth making them sweat over it? I, I tend to ignore it or say, hey, on line 12, you've got an off by one error. And they'll they'll spot it. It's, it's not worth it. It's something they would see in the real world when they ran the code. I'm not gonna show you the coding question I use because then I'd have to pick a new one and I like my coding question too much. But here's the example of the kind of thing I'm talking about. So this would be aimed at web developers who are expected to write JavaScript uh, it's kind of showing, can they fetch some JSON and append some stuff to the page? I wouldn't expect them to remember the DOM APIs. I'm just looking to see if they know how the DOM works and how async code works, because that, that is something that they will have to do in the real world. And then in like a second phase of the question, I'd say, okay, our API returns 10 results at a time. You know, we'll fix that one day. But in the meantime, we'd like to display 50 results at once. Can you make that happen with this API? So now they have to do five fetches. Um, it tests more advanced async stuff. Can they return the stuff in the right order? Uh, do they fetch it one by one or do they fetch it all together? Um, do they wait until they've got all of the results before putting any of them on the page? Like these are all little phases. They, you know, they might choose, um, yeah, they, they fetch the first set of results and then they start fetching the next one. And then you could say to them, hey, you know, is there any way you could make this faster by you know, well, I wouldn't tell them by fetching it all at once unless they needed the hint, but see if they could figure that out themselves. Like there are many layers to something like this. Um, ask them if there are certain user interactions that might cause bugs here. Like could they spot if the, you know, the user enters submit multiple times before the previous results have come back, you might end up with 
those sort of things into leaving? Do they know how to handle that? You know, do they know how to handle that in an efficient way? It's a really basic question. It's something that we tend to do in our jobs quite a lot, fetching some data and displaying it. But even to something like this, there are so many layers that you can add to see where the candidate's at. Yeah, and as, and as we mentioned earlier, you can take it down many different paths depending on where the candidate's strengths are, which hopefully at this point you've talked to them about. If they are, you know, more into visualization and you want to see, and that's something that you actually need on your team as well, maybe you want to change it up and lead it down that path. Maybe they can visualize the in-progress request or something like that. It's nice to have these questions that are flexible and you can bend them a little bit to fit more towards the candidate so you can make the candidate shine at their strengths. Absolutely. Uh, and once all that's done, you say goodbye to the candidates. Uh, you've still got work to do because you need to rate the candidate's performance. Uh, I would say make sure you stick to what happened in the interview. This comes into play when the candidate is someone you know, uh, either a friend or like someone with a, a, an online profile that you're aware of. Let's say that candidate A performs better than candidate B, but you know candidate B and you know they didn't show their best in the interview and you decide, oh, they're actually better than candidate A right, based on some other stuff you know. But maybe candidate A wasn't showing their best either. So it's kind of unfair that you're you know, offering that leeway to candidate B and not candidate A. I would say if you're unsure, do another round of interviews, get them both back in again. Also, write your assessment straight afterwards. Make notes during the interview, but write up your conclusion straight away because your memory doesn't get better with time. No, it really doesn't. And I would also say that's something that I have experienced and therefore do in my when I interview as well, tell the candidate that you are taking notes because especially right now in a virtual setting, it can often seem like you're not paying attention. You're just chatting with your work friends while you're waiting for the candidate to come up with a solution. Um, because you know maybe you're a touch typist and you can look the person in the eye while typing. I can that to an extent, but often, especially when it's coding things, I do look at my notes. Um, yeah, just make sure the candidate knows that you are being respectful and you're listening even if you're not looking at them and typing. I've been on both sides of the table on that one. I've yeah, felt like the, I was being ignored because they were just sort of looking away going, uh-huh, tap, 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 uh-huh, tap, 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 yeah. But they're, they're <laughs> making notes, That's which is the right thing to do. Yeah, also agree on a rating system. So each interviewer is scoring the same way. That, that kind of thing really helps. Also, come to your conclusion before speaking to anyone else who is doing the interview because group and attitude polarization is a thing. Like, even without you knowing it, by talking to someone else, your opinion... It might even change, but it's more likely to become more extreme. So record your own viewpoint. So when you discuss it with other interviewers, like you can be persuaded, of course. Uh, you know, they can say, well, I felt this, and you could you know, adjust your own viewpoint, but make sure you have your initial viewpoint and make sure that's heard. Yeah, I think in general, biases are a thing to be aware of. And it can be biases introduced after the interview, as you say, by talking to other people be with without, you know, somehow writing down a conclusion first, but also make sure in the interview to be aware that we as humans suck at being neutral and open-minded. Usually we see a person, we have an opinion somewhere in the subconscious of our brain, and it can and most likely will affect how you perceive what they're doing. Their gender, their race, their earrings, all of these things can and probably will affect your evaluation and you need to work hard to not let them influence you and use fair criteria. Yeah, and that's really at the root of all of these tips and rules that I've that I've put into this presentation is is to just try and avoid bias and avoid unconscious bias as much as possible. It can't be eliminated, but you can avoid it uh, through some of these methods. But that's all I've got. Uh, but it did get me a balloon, uh, <laughs> and it also got me some good teammates as well. Well, well I'm not sure about that. <laughs> Focus on the documentation and, and the naming. <clears throat> I squeaked while I said that. Make notes during the interview, but write up the conclusion straight away, because your memory... Oh, I can't speak today. We're so close to the end. <laughs>